I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversations on Art series with our host, Meg Linton, and guest artist, Deborah Ashheim. Brentwood Art Center's success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through thick and thin. We can only do all that we do because of our generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and to education. I'd like to be sure to mention that BAC's new campus in Santa Monica, located at 1625 Olympic Boulevard, is open for in-person courses and that our spring 2024 term begins on April 8th. The campus is very close to 18th Street Art Center, Crossroads School, and a Metro stop is just around the corner. We're excited to be offering in-person classes once again, and so your support is more important than ever. Our host, Meg Linton, and I met at Otis College of Art and Design while Meg was the director of exhibitions for the Ben Maltz Gallery, and I was the dean of continuing education. The divisions collaborated on many public programs, and we are thrilled to bring Meg's love and respect for the artists here to BAC. Meg has been visiting artist studios for well over 20 years in her various roles as director and curator of contemporary art spaces in Southern California. Currently, Meg is lead producer on a documentary film about feminist performance art in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s called Acting Like Women, directed by Sherry Galke. She is working on an exhibition about the artist Keith Julius Buccinelli that opened September 2024 at UC Santa Barbara. She's writing a novel and, of course, conversing with Deborah for the BAC this afternoon. I'd like to welcome Meg Linton. Thank you, Amy. It's great to see you. And I'm glad um, everyone can be here today. Um, I think I can still say Happy New Year. Uh, it's, it's the year of the dragon, so that's exciting. And I um, wanna thank all of our, um, our guests and also all of the BAC staff um, for making this program possible. I really appreciate everyone's F behind the scenes efforts. And I wanna thank the BAC's anonymous donor who continues to make this program possible. Um, and let's see, welcome to our conversations on art and our first, vir first virtual studio visit in 2024 is with the artist, Deborah Ashheim. Before I introduce our guest, I have the usual housekeeping. We are recording this, this presentation and we ask that you please mute your microphones and turn off your video. Uh, and during the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and I will either work them into the discussion or I will save them and ask them at the end. Um, in the chat box, you'll also see that I've put some additional information about our artist today. And you can also, I put also put instructions on how to save the chat box um, as a file. So you can have that for later if you wanna peruse on your own. Deborah Ashheim and I started working together in the mid nineties. Um, and it's been incredible to watch her evolve from a sculptor into an artist and activist with a multidisciplinary approach, working with civic, academic and nonprofit entities in the public sphere. She makes a positive difference in the lives she touches and every image we're going to see today has a compelling story behind it. Her strategies for art making are both simple and complex and please ask questions along the way. We're gonna launch in because there's a lot to see and talk about this afternoon. So Deborah, welcome. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday to come be um, part of this event. And um, yeah, I'm gonna show you some projects from the past five years or so. For, uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, my work has been um, really uh, comes out of uh, a lot of in-depth community engagement but my work has been about memory for like the past 20 years. And um, so one of the areas of memory that I'm really interested in is the intersection of memory and place and the way that we remember events and the way that um, our uh, complicated memories of events inform our understanding of our lives in the present. So um, in 
2017, um, I was um, I got a great opportunity to be one of the artists to participate in Art on Market, which is a really cool program. All of you that are artists should try to do it. Um, it's a uh, 36 bus kiosks and bus stop um, stands on Market Street in San Francisco, and they um, commission different artists every year to do posters for all 36. And so. 2017 was the 50th <clears throat> anniversary of the summer of love <clears throat> excuse me and um and so i was interested in i did a project called the zeitgeist that was exploring like the, the radical artistic creative intellectual and political context of the bay area that kind of gave birth to the summer of love and made it a magnet for alternative thinking people so i went up to um, archives in the bay area and i researched a lot of these movements this is the um, an early uh, photo. This is a drawing from an early photograph um, by Ruth Marion and Baruch, um, who did a lot of uh, community organizing with the Black Panther Party, which formed in Oakland in 1966 to protect the African American community. Uh, next slide. Um, but I had been doing a lot of work about um, uh, 1960s uh, protest movements. I was really interested in. Um, excavating this history because of another project I had done down in Orange County about the Nixon and Vietnam years. And so this is a drawing that I made of the free speech movement that started in Berkeley in 1964. And uh, Deborah, can just the about the the project down in OC about Nixon. Yeah, there was, there was a key moment there where that where you were trying to figure out how you were going to engage with people. So can you just yeah, so my work share, is because it was kind of a landmark thing for you in terms of your process. Yeah, yeah. So I know we were trying to not talk about too many projects today. But I know. Very big thing. Okay. So, um, so my work had been about memory, um, going back to like 2005 or something, which I was exploring from like a neurological point of view, memory in the brain, autobiographical point of view. I was very interested in the relationship with, um, Alzheimer's disease in my family, and then after a while, I got sick of, um space inside my head I think and I started thinking about collective memory so I was looking for collective memory in the spaces of like architecture public space and events like and for me a big event that I remembered as being sort of shocking and and experiencing it personally I think I'm going to say September 11th but and that's true too but actually was the resignation of Richard Nixon which is kind of a weird thing for somebody my age to say because I was nine but it was really shocking to me and I got invited to be artists in residence at the Orange County Great Park, which was a new park that had just formed in Orange County. And I was curious to see, because I associated that park with Nixon, it had been his Air Force base when he flew back and forth between Washington and California in the 60s and 70s. So I wanted to see if other people had memories of Nixon and I sat down with a little chair and I had a sign that said, tell me your Nixon story. And I was gonna do this oral history project. Nobody told me any stories. So I started making drawings trying to illustrate the memories in my head of Nixon on the airplane, you know, saying I'm not a crook, getting on the helicopter, going all the way back to actually JFK assassination, which I was not born for, but I have memories like of John Jr. saluting the casket that feel like personal memories, even though I wasn't alive when they happened. And I started um, drawing some of these iconic images and it was amazing because they serve as triggers for people to come up and say, I remember that, or I was part of that, or I was there when that happened. And so all, my entire life as an artist, I've been making work that was a little bit more abstract or esoteric. I was, it was gratifying to me the interaction I had with the art audience, but there, I knew there was this massive audience that I had never connected with. People that don't necessarily like go to art museums and galleries or don't necessarily think abs more abstract work is for them. And I'd always really loved representational drawing. So I started making these very detailed drawings. This is UC Irvine on May 4th, 1970, which is like right after um, Nixon who had run on a promise of ending the war in Vietnam, instead went on television and explained that he was um, expanding the war into Cambodia where he and Kissinger had been secretly bombing for months already. And college campuses across the country burst into protest at the newly built UC Irvine campus, students took over the library. Um, and um, at Kent State in Ohio, um, they, they had brought in the National Guard to quell the student protests, and they famously opened fire with live ammunition on the unarmed students, killing four and injuring nine. These kids don't know that that's happened yet because it's a little bit earlier in California, but and we didn't have like the 24 hour news cycle yet. But mm -hmm. I didn't even know that this existed. People told me in my project that they were part of the protest movement at UC Irvine, and I was like, 
no way, dude. I taught at UC Irvine for five years. It's not a very activist campus. It's not Berkeley. And people were like, go look it up. And so I went in the archives and I found these amazing images of the protest movement at UC Irvine. Well, and, and that's so one of the things you've been able to uncover with a lot of your projects is these areas where people thought there was no protest activity or they weren't dealing with issues that may be seen as more on the national front. They were at the local levels. Well, I would even say more than that in the work I'm doing now, I'm kind of interested in like, like this is the first project I did that became a kind of like a sprawling vernacular history that told lots of different people's stories from different points of view. I didn't mm -hmm. weigh in on what their credibility was. It could be a fourth grader, you know, that garbled something they learned about Nixon in fourth grade. And it could be a lot of people misremembered stuff. Somebody was like, Nixon, didn't his wife say, just say no to drugs? And I was like, no, that was Reagan, you know, but, um, but later, the projects I'm doing now, where I'm working a lot with, with different communities, I'm really interested in, there are stories that people tell each other that don't always make it into the official version of history. Right. So for example, the official version of the history of UC Irvine somehow doesn't include this moment of extreme activism, you know, this sort of transition from when they opened in 1965 to like 1971 or two, when there was really, when you think of um, the UCs and activism, you think about... Um, you know, uh, Berkeley and maybe Santa Barbara, and, but mm -hmm. you know, you don't think about these new colleges that they had just opened, you know, San Diego, um, I think Merced or something was the other one. Um, yeah. So anyways, we, I'll, well, I'll get to this in a minute, but the other thing that is really interesting to me is that within um, uh, cultural communities, particularly underserved cultural communities, sometimes you find that there are well-known stories that people have been telling each other for years that don't make it into the mainstream sort of history. And some examples that have got a national prominence that people have been telling each other for years might be, for example, the Tulsa race massacre, which everybody feels like they've always known about their whole lives, but I think a lot of people found out about in 19, in 2020, you know, and, and um, or like, if you know a little bit more, there was like a, a coup um, in Wilmington, North Carolina um, it, during the Jim Crow era, which is sort of well known now always these stories were always told in the african-american community i know a lot of people you know that that's grandparents lived in tulsa in the 20s they grew up hearing these stories but there was you couldn't find them you know people weren't talking about mm -hmm. them to each other. so that's really interesting to me the things that like everybody knows but it's not the version so right that was part of what i was at, was thinking about i wasn't this wasn't formed yet in my mind when i was doing this project in san francisco i just was kind of curious i was like well everybody sort of thinks of this as sex, drugs, and rock and roll, already when they invited me to do this, which was in 2016, there were like Trader Joe's bags that had flower power, you know, logos all over them. And they were already heavily merchandising the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. And they invited three artists that I think I'm the only one that was born. The other two are a little younger than me, but none of us were around, you know, during the Summer of Love. And, um, and so they wanted to know our perspective on it. And so I wanted, I was thinking, why San Francisco? And at the time, I was really interested in the 60s stuff. So I was just thinking, um, okay, it's 2016. Hillary Clinton's going to be president. Um, you know, everything's <laughs> cool. You know, there used to be protests, but now there's like online petitions. And um, and I want to remind San Francisco, which I was seeing as this kind of like commodified, commercialized space that was becoming this tech place that was losing its heart. I wanted to remind them that it had been a hotbed of, you know, music, arts, culture, alternative ways of, of thinking um, and, um, and politics. Um, and I had no idea when I started researching. So I found some really cool things. Like this was a group I knew about, but had forgotten. I was really into these guys when I was a kid, but this is Emmett Grogan. And he was one of the founders of the Diggers, which is a group that came out of the San Francisco Mime Troupe. And they were like super against capitalism. So like one of the ways that they were trying to bring down capitalism was by, um, offer it like for all the kids that ran away in the summer of love and were living in the park they had made big cauldrons of soup and if you showed up with a spoon and a bowl you could get um you could get free food and they had a free store and everything in the store was free it was kind of like goodwill or salvation army but everything was free but they weren't philanthropists or humanitarians they were trying to bring down capitalism by making money irrelevant you know which is like mm -hmm. ridiculous but really sweet you know so anyways that's what i was thinking but meanwhile what happened? So I so, you know, so I was really interested in the anti-war movement. I found some very obscure groups that have left almost no footprint, like the Vanguard, which was a, actually a um, 
uh, LBJ um, Great Society program, but they were operated in, um, in the Tenderloin and they were just a bunch of homeless kids that had been kicked out of their families for being gay. And they were, um, and they had, the, the only reason we know about them really, I mean, there's some people that remember, um, but they had made a mimeograph zine, you know, this little Xerox thing. And mm -hmm. so this was a, a drawing I made from a picture in their zine of when they had done a, a cleanup on Market Street. They borrowed brooms from the city and sweep the city clean, the Market Street clean as a tongue in cheek protest because this um, police were sweeping them up for vagrancy. That's what they would call right. it. Um, I have a and, question. Yeah. While these posters were up. Did any of the people you depicted, I mean, did or did any, did you find anyone who was there? Well, or so, so people, I combined people... them with like oral histories from people that I could find. So, for example, for the Black Panther one, Kathleen Cleaver let me use a quote from her that I found um, in a in a documentary called the um, Black Power Mixtape, and she mm -hmm. said, "Yeah, that's fine." And so I used that. There was a um, a priest that was part of this movement because it was run out of a church, um, Glide Ministries, Adrian Ravenauer, and so he let me use. You know, he and I talked a bunch of times, and I, I got a quote from him. So in some cases, I connected with the people. Um, but like, yeah, like these young people that were, and I got these images at like the Bancroft Library at um, UC Berkeley, at the mm -hmm. archives at um, UC Santa Cruz, you know, and so um, in most cases, the photographers were deceased and had left their archives to the um, to the libraries. But like the one on the right um, is a is a, a guy named Eric Thierman. He's and he's a great guy. He's a photographer who lives in Santa Cruz, and so. I was able to talk to him about you know that experience. He was there that day at the Great Human Bean, which was like, I suppose the, the epitome of the Summer of Love, even though it happened in January of that year. According to San Francisco lore, the Summer of Love was fully over by like March of 1967. And by the time the summer had, came, it, it had yeah. been over for a long time. Yes, so anyways, between when I made these, wanting to take people on this sort of nostalgic, sort of like, you know, wanting to you know bring some of that spirit back into San Francisco, Things changed dramatically, as you might recall. A very unexpected uh, result happened to the 2016 election. And all of a sudden, this is the weekend after, I found myself in a crowd of people marching from MacArthur Park to the federal building for a big rally where we were all going to try to figure out what were we going to do now that we were going into um, you know, the presidency of Donald Trump. And so the meaning of my posters, even though I'd already drawn them all and they were already at the printer, changed dramatically between when I researched them, when I talked to people about what they meant to the people who had experienced them, what I thought this legacy was. It went from a kind of a legacy project wanting to remind San Francisco you know, of its core identity or whatever I thought, to um, this, um, these images that we were looking at more urgently, trying to figure out how did they fight back? How did they resist? How can we rebuild the resistance? What worked and what didn't? You know, everything about them changed. And that was like so fascinating to me. And I mm -hmm. also realized, because I suddenly, I guess next slide. Um, yeah, I started see I started, you know, so the boots on the ground, you know, visible people in the streets protest movement, you know, came roaring back. So in the upper right hand corner, I started finding myself at all of these events. And I realized I couldn't just be excavating historical archives. I had to be witnessing this history being made now. So at, like at the upper left hand corner, those are two women that were at that with me and a lot of other people um, at LAX airport when they did the Muslim ban, the travel ban in 2017, and everybody just, you know, raced like a giant flash mob to the airport. Um, that's a mother and child in the middle from the women's march in DC because my friend and I went to be part of the first women's march and um and the bottom right hand corner is just from is from a 2020 um, Black Lives Matter protest in San Francisco I mean in uh, Pasadena so if you go to neverfacebook.com um mm. which is an ironically named website that I made because now I'm on, on Instagram a lot and it was kind of a, pro a protest with no teeth but anyways um you'll see drawings that I made from over the past. Uh, eight years now of protests since 2016. So I got back to Pasadena. Next slide, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went and I ta was talking to Rochelle Branch, who's the head of the Arts and Culture Commission. I said, oh, I did this great project in San Francisco that was about taking this history of activism and putting it back at the sites where it occurred. And it was really cool to put these posters at the same locations where events had happened. We should do something like that down here. I wish we had a project like that. And she said, well, you could propose it. Why don't you just go get an individual artist grant and then go to Pasadena Transit and see if they'll let you. They have some bus stops that are 
set aside as like for public service announcements and you could see if they'll let you use them. So I was like, okay, great idea. So I did. And I partnered with um, Chicano Studies Research Center at um, UCLA and um, they had the archive of La Raza photographers. And La Raza was an influential bilingual journal of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement that published in East LA from like 1966 to 1976. And, and so I wanted to tell the story of the 1968 East LA, East LA high school student walkouts. And I used the images from La Raza photographers. So I went and like had lunch with each one and got their permission. And this one, I really dove deeper into the oral history. So I interviewed about 30 people who had been participants in the high school student walkout. So this is pretty well known, but um, especially because there, there were a lot of symposiums and other things around the anniversary. But in 1968, students from like, I think it was like 12 East LA high schools and Venice High coordinated walkouts in order to protest discrimination against largely Mexican American students in the schools. They were um, they weren't allowed to speak Spanish. They got disciplined for speaking Spanish at school. They were sent to like they call them. Um, you know, bonehead classes, or they had, they were sent to like vocational classes and um, you know, like auto mechanics and cosmetology instead of college classes. And they were, and teachers said racist things to them. And, um, and so I wanted to tell this um, history, but my projects that are about history are always really about today. Like history is a way that you can tell a story using a public utility and public money and public space about thing, issues that are still going on um, without being partisan. And so that's kind of a strategy that I used. And I was, and my underlying goal for this was also to, um, to empower and support people who are under 18 now and to let them know that um, protesting, um, high school student protest is an effective and legitimate and um, uh, you know, constitutionally protected way for them to be civically engaged even if they're too young to vote. And the other reason I wanted to do this project was I wanted to um, to uh, build the story of the Pasadena high school activism into the East LA story, because the East LA story is really well known and the Pasadena um, story has almost never been told. So in Pasadena also, there was a consortium of student activists that met together across the three different Pasadena high schools and there was discrimination in the schools and there were walkouts and there was what the LA Times and Pasadena Star News called called a riot, but if you talk to people that participated in the activism, they said it was not a riot. It was just, you know, it was a walkout and it got a little bit rambunctious, but it was the same issues as in um, LA, but in, but it was um, African-American students as well as, um, as Latino students that were um, being discriminated against. So I, so I did posters for 18 Pasadena bus stops. And then I also had these oral history stories with illustrations, some of which I, I found in like old Pasadena yearbooks and um and I, and so, I put Deborah, so Deborah, the text in these is quotes from the oral history you did and then from newspapers or is it no, just it's all from people. All the okay. quotes are from people. And they're on the bus they were in English and Spanish. So they were on all 29 Pasadena transit buses. And the and it, it expanded a little bit. So it basically became a celebration of like 50 years of high school student activism because I wanted to expand it to also talk about the Pete Wilson years and some of the um, protesting against, um, what was, it, was it Proposition 187, the one that was going to deny um, like any civil services and you know, oh, yeah. hospitals, education to immigrants, which was a horrible, horrible law that passed um, and then was immediately ruled unconstitutional. And so, um, so I had also included some protesters from like the 80s and the 90s and um, and it was, and the thing that was really cool was the timing, you know, just like you can't control the context, like just like in San Francisco, I didn't know that when my posters went up, there were going to be people protesting against the new repressive policies of the Trump administration. When these posters went up, it coincided with the Parkland movement. So actually I asked the city to put them outside of like near high school, Pasadena high school, some of the schools in Pasadena, and the kids wound up marching right past my posters when all those kids had that national day of action to get for um, reform of gun of gun laws um, after the wow. shooting. Yeah. So Deborah, we have a question that's an aesthetic question. How do you decide when to use color and not? So I, in, the, in this work in particular, I use color to create focus. And so I, lately I've been using color more like, I don't know, across the board, you know, I've been using it full on, but, but in, um, in these works, 
um well it kind of started because san francisco like, like on market street it's so 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 crowded and there's so much going on and there's so much signage and so something full color honestly didn't stand out as much as something with really restrained color but like in this um picture this is the walkout of pasadena high school um and there was there was a lot going on in the photograph i worked from and i just wanted the interaction between these two young women to be your focus and so you know i use color to draw your eye in i think you remember the drawings as having more color than they do like there's this interesting way that just this very very um restrained color um can um can make it sort of come to life in a in, in a different way than when it's than when it's full-on color but that's been my strategy a lot of the time it, it's people love color and sometimes I, I just fall into it and give them full color, but I love to use it that way. Um, so I was, do, so after I did these projects, which I kind of like the one for Pasadena, I got a grant, but I'm more or less self-funded. I realized that, you know, this was kind of my main focus and that as long as um, we were living in a time where um, there was work that needed to be done, I guess, for sort of resisting some of the things I'm afraid might happen. I don't know how to put it better. I couldn't really keep a line between work I was doing that was sort of like art as activism and having some other kind of, of, of art be my practice. So I decided to have my job be doing this kind of work. So I um, got, uh, I was very fortunate to be hired to be the uh, artist in residence, they call us creative strategist for LA County Registrar Recorder County Clerk. So for 2019 to 2020, my job was to, was to do art as outreach. Well, actually, can we go back for a second? to historically underrepresented communities of voters. So for that year, um, until March, I was sent all over the county to meet voters help, and as we registered them, I would draw them and I would make art projects with them. So this we so I used to go to the immigration and naturalization ceremony. That's what this poster is from. These are newly minted citizens who are very excited about um, becoming okay, now we can go to the next slide. And one of the projects I did when I I I, I wasn't sure, you know, I had been doing community engagement and I've been including people's voices in my work, but I wasn't necessarily like going up to strangers and talking to them. So I thought, well, I'm gonna need an icebreaker. So I decided to do a project called 365 Days of Voters, which or originally was posted on LA County Registrar website and Facebook and Instagram and um, all that, but um, I took it over later. But um, so I'd go up to people and I'd say, hey, do you wanna to be today's voter? And I would take their picture and I would draw them and they would tell me why they were voting. And it was kind of what we, in voting we would call like peer to peer messaging. Like the most effective way to get people to vote is if their friend tells them that they're voting. And so, you know, the idea was that you would repost it and that you know, people would see it and they would go, oh, I didn't know Alex was voting, maybe I should vote. Well, famously, you might remember, we all got sent home, you can go to the next one now, um, on March 12th, 2020. And so I said, you know, how am I going to do voter outreach from home? Because all of our outreach events were canceled, um, yet we still had the 2020 election bearing down on us. And so they were like, you know, do you want to keep getting paid? Figure it out. And so I decided people could send me selfies. And then I lost all control of 365 <laughs> days of voters. Then 757 people wound up sending me selfies, not just from LA County, but from all over California. So these are a few of the people that I met. Some of them I met in person some of them from people sending me pictures. And these drawings, not all 757, but as many of them as possible, are gonna be exhibited at LAX airport to help get out the vote for 2024 election. So if you just feel like going there, because it's, um, not, it's not behind security, or if you are getting your baggage at the baggage claim for Delta, it'll be like, it's terminal two and three um, in the arrivals hall. And um, I think I have an image of what it's gonna look like. When's it, when's it being installed? I think April, we're hoping it's about the week, first week of April, there's like a contract nice. thing, but yeah. So, the, so, and then I'm also going to make five new drawings. So I, I think I have them in the next slide, the sketches at least. Yeah. Um, and they're going to- Wait, wait Nebra, before we jump into these, also yeah. with those drawings, you would offer to send people a copy of the drawing as well, right? Not for 365 days of voters. No, I know oh. sometimes, some people I did. Yeah, but I didn't like. I mean, I I didn't necessarily because it that's seven hundred and fifty seven people. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes people did want them, and then some very nice people were really generous, and so I was grateful that a few people sent me you know little PayPal donations to help pay for the um shipping. But I I mean I I if people like if people wanted to because I, I saw them as people's profile pics on Instagram for a while. 
like everybody they, they used they, they use the drawing as their profile picture yeah everybody got an email like with a picture of their drawing and saying your your drawing is live on instagram and it you know yeah. they got a um, jpeg of it and i might have mentioned like you know and then if they wrote back and said oh i love it then i might have said like oh you can have a print of it if you want but that was kind of more a little bit unofficial because yeah. um now when i draw people i always automatically give them a copy of their portrait but i don't try to draw almost a thousand people very often. <laughs> yes okay so, so anyway, now this is the this is the new part new part for the installation at the airport yeah so right this is what i'm working on right now in my studio and these drawings are pretty big they're like they're each 40 by 50 inches and they commemorate um three different um, legislative milestones in voting rights. So women's suffrage, you know, women got the right to vote in 1920. Um, the, the Voting Rights Act, which was in 1965, which um, at the time defeated a lot of the, or, you know, ruled against, created a mechanism for um, pushing back against some of the Jim Crow legislation that prevented African-Americans from actually exercising their right to vote um, in the in the South in particular, which has been somewhat dismantled by Shelby versus Holder in, 20, in 2013. But um, anyways, an important piece of legislation. And then something that almost nobody seems to remember about, but it was tied into my Vietnam project, which is the 26th Amendment, which passed in 1971 and lowered the voting age from uh, 21 to 18, which is kind of shocking. I think a lot of young people don't remember that or don't realize that like, if you were 18 in the 60s, you could get drafted, go be in a war and get killed and have no say about who about electing the politicians who decided, you know, what to authorize the war. So um, so those are all those are all. I, so we're putting um, those posters in the airport too to also help people um, appreciate that people fought for you to have this right. You know, it's really important. Have you encouraged it or engaged any of the kids who have wanted to even lower the voting age to like 16 I mean I know about it yeah I'm not involved with it or anything yeah yeah um, I just was wondering and if you'd had any dialogue with the high school students and so forth nope okay. but I know about it yeah. yeah okay so this is a project I've been working on since about 2019 or 2020 it's called Raleigh Stories and um and it's a it's another one of these sort of like sprawling vernacular history projects so um, uh, this is a project we, where we had a really um, for, uh, unusual situation where we were able to uncouple some of the public art money that was slated for an architecturally integrated work at a building that wasn't particularly accessible to the public and use it for other things. So one of the things I've been doing is, um, this is uh, in the beginning, I started uh, researching in historical archives and combining that with things people were telling me about particularly history of Raleigh Black communities. Um, so this is Leonard Medical School, which was one of the first um, like uh, medical schools to, that trained African-American physicians in the, like the 1890s and, um, and uh, next slide. And sometimes I worked with the North Carolina State Archivist and, um, and people would tell me stories um, that were like handed down from their grandparents or that they knew about the community. And then he would help me go through the archive and find great um, images to illustrate them. Um, next slide. But then as I started to meet more people, they would um, lend me uh, images to draw from for their, from their own family um, family histories and family archives. And so this is my friend Carmen Cowthen. Her um, uncle was the first Black Eagle Scout in Raleigh. So this is the Eagle Scouts marching down um, Fayetteville Street, which is a big street downtown in Raleigh um, in 1943. Ooh. And Oh, yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, okay. Just... Um, and also, you know, kind of consistent with what I'm doing with what I've been doing now in California. Also, sometimes, so next slide, um, documenting um, history being made now. So um, there's a group in Raleigh called Emancipate North Carolina that works a lot on police reform and, and, um, and um, justice reform. And they invited me to march with them um, during the summer of 2021. Um, there was a group called the New Freedom Riders, and they were going to all the state capitals in the South for the states that had passed new um, voter suppression legislation, and they had these Black Voter Matters marches. Um, these drawings are really big. They're um, I, that somehow that chat question yeah. popped up. They're um, this one's these are probably like forty by fifty or sixty inches. There's one more of these two. And the other how, ones are the other how, ones are how do you group them? 
do you, I mean, would you put these two images side by side or? I don't know what's going to happen to these. Technically they belong to the city of Raleigh. And so um, I don't, I, and, and I, and mostly the, the drawings I've made for them are fairly small, kind of on purpose so that I can scan them and that they can collect them. And these were just like, it was just such a cool event. And, and you know, I got home and I just wanted to draw it these big drawings and really dive in and so um wait I don't know I have one more things. question yeah. how did you get connected with Raleigh I mean do you listen I applied for a regular public art project like I do public oh. art for a living I haven't really showed you guys but like I, I make things for buildings and that's what it was going to be and I'm not going to go into it too much but through a series of events including COVID and um, honestly, the um, police reform post, you know, the, the protest movement coming out of um, the murder of George Floyd in 2020, a, a cascade of events made it, um, I can't really explain it, made it possible for us to decouple the fund, some of the funding and use it for community engagement. And mm -hmm. so this, this, this became this really cool project. It's kind of a test case of what public art could be beyond necessarily just being something for a building. It had always been a building that was a kind of a questionable site because the public doesn't really have access to it. And everybody, and they just had a really great um, public art panel board, whatever, that said, let's see, let's just use more of the money for stuff for the community. And a lot of people were doing this post 2020 because a lot of things were closed. You know, I know a lot of other like um, funding that went to like, exhibition programs in libraries or, you know, there was, uh, I even MoCA was doing like panels and, you know, there was a lot of um, ways that people were trying to keep the programming going when institutions were closed or you couldn't go to physical spaces. So it was right. just a really neat confluence of things. Like I don't, I had no idea when I applied for it, but it just turned out that they have, they have this really great program. I love them. And they're doing all this really other neat stuff. Um, they have like temporary public art projects that emerging artists can apply to do in the parks like three times a year you know they just have all this really they're 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 just they're just some neat people that are trying to think of other ways that the money that's funded by capital construction when a city makes a library or a park or yeah. a place for fire station like the one percent for the arts kind of thing yeah yeah how can some of that funding um serve the community in different ways and also with a particular eye towards um, neighborhoods or um, populations within the city that don't necessarily have good access to arts and culture. And so um, I, it was just serendipity that I met them and we're on the same page and we're trying to invent new ways to do public art. So Raleigh Stories, um, a lot of it, it was just sort of like pop-up events or people reaching out to me and sharing their stories with me and me putting them on Instagram. But it's also this giant archive. So at the end of the project, which ends at the end of this year, like uh, December 2024, they get like this these boxes of 250 drawings that are going to go into oh, nice. the collection. But we're also finding things to do with them, be and and also we're transferring everything from Instagram, which is just for convenience, to a um, City of Raleigh hosted website. So like this is one person I met at at a arts event, Virginia Scott Miller, and she has a um, a children's bookstore that um, has like diverse you know representation of you know of art. It's a children's bookstore for, so that kids don't have to have children's books that have only white children. And, you know that, so it's got really cool um, uh, different artists and um, and children's book writers and share stories that are from uh, really global and and tell stories from all over. But you know, so they're that's for, I they were really neat to meet. Um, and sometimes it's people I meet like that. Just that was just like at first Friday or whatever they have there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's stories that I. Um, and working on for a long time with somebody. So like, this is my friend, Joe Holt Jr. And I met him at the very beginning of the project when he agreed to work with me to share his story. And we probably worked on it for two years. So Joe grew up in Raleigh back when people still had chickens in the city and he lived on Oberlin Road, which is a kind of famous neighborhood um, that was originally a free slave community. And when he was 14, it was two years after um, the Supreme Court had passed Brown versus Board of Education saying that separate but equal was not constitutional. And his family decided to be the first ones in Raleigh to apply for an African-American kid to go to one of the all white schools, which were better than the black schools. And um, next slide. And Joe's family tried from when he was in middle school until he graduated high school to apply for him to go to the school um, that was right down the street from his house instead of taking the city bus to the black school across the city. 
and he got turned down and he got turned down and they took it all the way to federal court. They would have taken it to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court wouldn't hear these cases. And um and he and somebody else wound up being the first kid to desegregate the Raleigh Public Schools. And he grew up to be mayor of Atlanta and he got really famous. And Joe went into the Air Force. And so um I want this is the kind of story that I feel really passionate about telling where um, you know, where somebody was sort of like left out of history, like his family made sacrifices so that Bill Campbell could be honestly could be the first person to go to um, the all white school. They Joe was taken away to live on a farm with with neighbors because there were credible threats that he could be abducted. This was only a couple of years after the murder of Emmett Till. His dad lost his job. They they yelled epithets at him and threw eggs at his house. Finally, in 2022, as right as we were finishing up working on it. His family was um, honored with a civil rights trail marker on Oberlin Road, of, of, mm-hmm. like a few feet from where his house had been. So that was great. And it was really cool to be able to end it on a grace note. But more than anything, I wanted to just take this story and as much as I could, and I'm not the only one doing it, other people are trying to tell Joe Holt's story too, but make sure he gets his place in history. Because it's like, you know, for everybody that breaks through, for every Jackie Robinson, you know, that, that breaks the color barrier. There's a lot, a lot of people that are working on it and making sacrifices and, and we should know their names too. So another really great thing that I got to do with some of this project money for Raleigh Stories was create mentorship projects for um, four locally emerging artists that were really great. They're, they're good artists. They're, they're, you know, they're not um, students or anything, but they were new to public art and public art is a really particular skill set. So I just wanted to give them each a little bit of money and let invite them to do a project in the park that could um, help them get their you know toe in the door to maybe um, create a kind of a professional development opportunity that, for them to be able to do public art. So the guy on the bottom left, Akira Dudley, for his five thousand dollar little Deborah Ashan grant or whatever Raleigh Stories grant, um, he decided to do a art and music festival at Peach Road Park. So the next slide is people that I met at his festival. I came there to do Raleigh stories with them. And um and it's a really cool park because it's got a lot of um like people who have moved here from Afghanistan and a lot of Spanish speakers and it's a super diverse park. And so some so this year we're t- starting to take some of the um portraits that I made of the Raleigh community and install them on the buildings where I met the people. So this is Peach Road Park with some of these um portraits installed on the um outside of the building, kind of goes all the way around and makes a connection between the people that make the park what it is. This is another one that's getting installed next week. It's Walnut Creek Wetlands Park, which is quite an amazing park. It actually has gotten federal recognition as one of the as one of 21 parks that were recognized as um, wetlands by the EPA. But um, uh, this is in the neighborhood that is called um, Biltmore Hills and Rochester Heights. And it was the first black subdivision in Raleigh. Um, and it was, and so, you know, Raleigh had actual gym unlike California had like legislative you know Jim Crow segregation. So the when the um when they first became developers wanting to build um houses for the emerging like black professional class, they were only allowed to build in an historically flood um flood prone area. And so this park, which is a beautiful nature park in Raleigh now, was really a partnership between environmental nonprofits, St. Ambrose Cathedral, which is a very um environmentally justice oriented um, church, uh, congregation that's right nearby, and then residents of um, of these two neighborhoods that you know maybe were like eight years old and watched them building a whole subdivision just for black people is kind of amazing. All the streets are named after famous African Americans like Cab Calloway and B. King, and um, and then in the middle is um, Norman Parks, who was one of the founders. He was the founder of the of the park and the, and he was committed to the idea of um, hands on high level nature education for urban minority youth. So it's kind of, there's a it's really amazing place. And there was nothing in this park that told the story. So this is going to be um, installed next week. There's these portraits and all of these projects have an online component where there's more in, um, video and text and you can learn the story um, so that you don't just think, oh, this is a really beautiful park, but not know the part about um, the environmental justice part, which is why it's an important space. Deborah, just a technical question. What are these drawings mounted on or are they so the ones especially in, the ones that are outside yeah the outside ones um so this is so what we did was we took this money that wasn't very much money and we broke it into tiny 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 pieces of money and then we tried to like wring as much content out of the money as we could so the um so the ones on the um at Petro Park 
a local guy um printed them on metal i he he um I'm not sure, you know, he said it was proprietary. They definitely have a UV protection. You know, they might not last forever. They might have to get remade. These, I just wanted them because they were indoors and um, and you can get pretty close to them. I worked with Weldon Color Lab because they're my favorite mm -hmm. printers in LA. And, you know, so we made them here. And they're and they're um, face mounted on um, acrylic with sinker backing. And so nice. um, they're just, you know, they, they're basically just the same as, as a gallery work or something. Yeah. But usually, um, there's required, you know, again, if it was the the original architectural work, it would have to be, you know, guaranteed that it will last for 25 years. We just want it. All of these neighborhoods that we chose for these projects um, are um, neighborhoods that don't have good access to arts and culture. In LA County, we've done data mapping, so we know which those neighborhoods are. They hadn't done that in Raleigh. And so they, I, I said, well, how do I figure out which neighborhoods? And they said, you know, we haven't, we haven't mapped access to arts and culture, but they've mapped food deserts and um so we know which neighborhoods don't have a supermarket and we're going to give you that map because if they don't have a supermarket we don't think they probably have a way to get downtown and park and go to the art museums and so that's the neighborhood that we put and then this is my last project and i don't want to keep talking be the whole time so that you can ask questions but this is called um this is a project it doesn't have a name actually this is a project i'm working on right now for robinson park in pasadena there's me and another artist we have separate projects but we're both doing stuff for the park. Her name's Carla J. Harris. She's great. And so there's a Instagram called um, Robinson Park Project that you can see some of these on. And this is, and some of this, and this is a story of Northwest Pasadena, which is a neighborhood where I live, which is a very, very interesting and very diverse neighborhood. But because of Pasadena had a very extreme redlining and um, it was the only place where you could buy a house until 1940s for sure, probably 1970s if you were African-American, Latino, Japanese-American, probably Jewish or Italian. So this was first day AME church. Um, the other thing that, about our, mm -hmm. my neighborhood is um, a lot of the historically um, uh, uh, black neighborhood and, the, and some of the really important um, landmarks were torn down by eminent domain because of the proposed 710 freeway, which is now killed and because of building the 210 freeway and because of building public housing. So there's a lot of stories, again, that people um, that live in my neighborhood tell each other. Um, I'm learning some of them, even though I've lived here a long time, and that aren't necessarily the stories that, that maybe the rest of LA or America think of when they think of Pasadena. So this is Cinema 21, which had which is a, um, on Washington and uh, near Lake Avenue. And it showed, it was an African-American um, movie theater. It had no parking. So kids would just walk down and go to like double features. And it and according to many people I talked to, it showed black exploitation, kung fu, and scary movies. That was it. And um, and because it had no parking, it was it was it was mostly um just you know teenagers from the neighborhood or little kids would go down there. But then um in the 70s and 80s, when Pasadena's demographics started changing and more Spanish-speaking people. Um, started moving into Pasadena, it became a Spanish language cinema. And a lot of people would, um, from the same neighborhood that were moving into the Northwest would um, would come to this theater to, to and to feel a little bit more at home is what my neighbor, Roberta um, Martinez told me. And then after that, it was an adult theater, which I did not grow. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, um, and then I've been meeting people whose stories I just love to share. So this is one of the recent um, stories I told on the Instagram, um, Darlene Anderson, and she um, and she was the first um, African American woman to break the color barrier in roller derby. So when she was 16 years old, she got recruited to be um, on uh, to go all over the country to be on the roller derby team. And it's it's a great story because um, she starts out sneaking downtown to go to the Olympic Auditorium for roller derby training, and she lied to her parents and said she was going ice skating because. Her mom wouldn't let her play underhand softball because it was not ladylike enough, and she had no idea she was playing roller derby. And um, and then she had this uh, amazing career in roller derby. Um, she was on the the team in Brooklyn. She met Jackie Robinson when she lived in New York. She was on the Hawaiian All Stars team, and so um, I encourage you to check out her story. She's she's I think somebody should make a movie out of it because it's a, it's a great story. She says her story is one of divine intervention that she never set out to be the person to break the color barrier. And roller derby but that um she was you know she, she just feels like it was a story of divine intervention so that's is that my last slide no no okay oh, well, wait. Stop, what are you saying is there um 
weren't you saying there's something happening in Palm Springs about the roller derby, the story or something, or is she? No, oh, there's somebody that we were going to try to go meet up with that has the roller derby hall of fame, but I don't think it's a physical, I asked if we could go there, but I don't think it's a physical location. Oh. And actually he was going to FedEx me stuff to the, like, like this is a old um, Ebony magazine that Darlene has had since 1959. And so I kind of had to guess what Jackie Robinson looked like because his face was kind of all smudged away. But so he's supposed to have better copies of stuff and actual photographs because I want to, um, this is, a, a, this piece is going to eventually be an architecturally integrated piece and I want good source material to work from, but hopefully we can still take a road trip out there, but um, yeah, it's all in boxes. I well, yeah, because some of that stuff, it's, you know, people's personal archives and they yeah, well, and I'll, and I don't think there's a space. I don't think they have right. a building. Yeah, so I think we should stop now because the other slides in here are coming attractions, um, and so I think people could just follow the project and see them. Okay. But yeah, so don't show them yet because okay, I, I don't have time to talk about them. But this is this is Jerry and Brian Takeda, and um, and um, and they saw, and they've told, shared some amazing stories of the Japanese American community, a lot of which was people returning from the um the like Manzanar and the Japanese internment camps and restarting their lives from scratch in Pasadena after um, the 1940s. But, um, but I've been, but I haven't, um, we're still working on that. So I, I'd rather take questions right now. Does anybody have any questions? You can just type them into the chat box. Cause I already just talked so much. <laughs> I know. Well, you kind of just turn you well, on. I mean, Cause yeah. all the other, all the other ones are, I'd rather people see them with with the stories that people, I mean, people have yeah. improved the, so the way I work is people share stuff with me. I have a lot of paperwork so that they keep all the rights and control over their images. Everybody um, gets to see anything I produce and we work on it together. So for the text, we work back and forth. We usually, you know, it's like we're writing a book together and they, so these people, these guys have approved the drawings, but we haven't, um, we're still working on their story. Like usually it requires lunch and then we sit down and we go over the whole thing and then and then, um, and then uh, for Instagram, I'm going to post it. Um, you know, they're turning out to be pretty long. Like sometimes it's every day for seven days or ten days, or mm -hmm. and then eventually it'll be an online project that will be the companion piece to um, to the piece that will be installed in the rec center, which is um, Robinson Park on Fair Oaks in Pasadena. That's great. And again, I put all these links um, in the chat box, so if you want to save the chat. There's instructions on how to do that, and you can save those links for later if you want to sign up and follow any of Deborah's projects. And if you have a connection to Northwest Pasadena and you want to share your story, you're invited. Yeah. I think we're wrapped up. All right. On your website, you have some works that are more sculptural. I didn't quite get that question before it disappeared. Um. And you incorporate video. It's not yeah. really a question, but you have, you know, you've you've worked in a lot of different media. Yeah, for this presentation, we wanted it to be a little bit focused. And so um, I just picked a couple projects and they were all, um, they're all really the, they're based, I wanted to show this work I've been doing a lot lately, which is based in community engagement and also make a little pitch for voting because really, really, really couldn't be a more important election year. And if I had gotten funding for it, I probably would have con continued 365 days of voters, but I didn't. But um, but yeah, I, I still do sculpture. I haven't had a sculpture exhibit since 2019, just because I haven't sort of fallen back into that since everything being closed down. But, um, but um, I, yeah, I still do a lot of video. It, it, I actually think that it's too confusing if I were to show you everything that I do. So I, maybe you have to have three different talks. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this is what I've been doing really a lot lately. I think it started, I think it really started because of COVID. Like I was so lonely and I was so unhappy with when we were forced to stay home that I, I started, I, part of why people are always like, how were you able to make 757 drawings to people? And I was just so happy to see faces, you know, remember when we couldn't see anyone's faces because of the masks and, yes. um, and I, and, and that just kind of took me on this trajectory where it's, it's not sustainable the way I'm working right now. It's, it's a little bit, I can't have this many community engagement projects because it's just too much like, physically going places and meeting people like 
it's not quite leaving me enough time. It is, but it's borderline for thoughtfully right. transcribing all the recorded interviews and working back and forth with people. Cause you know, it starts out, I'll draw them and then they'll, go, then they have to do a lot of stuff. They have to go back through their family photos and find ones to illustrate the story. And for every like hundred to 150 words, we need a picture because you're not going to look at it on Instagram if there's a picture. And then eventually it's all going to get transferred to, you know, actual project websites. And I've got some other projects that are finished where there's a paid for each person on their story. And so, so they're getting kind of complicated. And, um, Do you but, have assistance? Um, uh, not really. Well, cause I imagine so much of this is also your personal rapport with people that. Yeah. It just turned out. They well, trust well, you with their stories. You know, this is a whole nother rabbit hole, but my back originally I wanted to be an anthropologist. That's what I studied in college. And then I found out what anthropologists do. And a lot of the kind of colonialism of, you know, not kind of the colonialism that is yeah. the history of anthropology. And so I think in a lot of ways, my practice has come full circle to the, like originally what I wanted to do when I was 18, 19 was be this person that goes and meets people that are very different from me, learns their stories, and helps them to, you know, to tell their stories in order to be understood the way that they want to be understood. Like that's all I ever wanted to do. And it took me, I'm not going to say how old I am, but a really long time, a whole lifetime to figure out how to do that as my practice. So it's very satisfying. And I think as I do it more, I'm getting better at like streamlining it or foregrounding it in my project proposal so that I can say, this is part of what I want you to pay me for. I'm going to make something for a building, but I'm also going to spend like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hours getting to meet people. And I want you to validate that work. And I want that to be part of what public work art is. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I look at it. Um, I just have a practical question about how much, how much do you need to do like another 365 project? I just wanted like $10,000 just so I could yeah. like buy materials and like, like I just, I mean, money is like the, like putting gas in your car, it lets you go blah, blah, blah amount of miles, you know? And so I kind of know what my, what kind of mileage right. I get, you know? And so I can say no, to, I can't always control it. Sometimes things just come cascading down on me. Sometimes there's slow times, although there really aren't anymore. Um, and um, so sometimes I can say no to something because I want to do something else. Like, like ever since I've had this job with the registrar recorder, I'm sort of the go-to person for elections because I had to learn reams right. of particularly California election law in order to have that job. And so um, I work with a lot of um, community and grassroots organizations to try to get out the vote. So I know if it's an election year, you know, I, I kind of always, um, in the pie chart of my time, I always like set aside more time in a, in an even numbered year. And in an odd mm -hmm. numbered year, I can maybe like go take a, do a residency or, you know, do something right. unrelated to politics. But it, it seems like at least when we're in this current crisis, which I can't foresee ending anytime soon, I'm going to be called upon to do that work every time it's yeah. an election year. So like last year, I went to Georgia and North Carolina and spent weeks, you know, working on campuses to get out the vote in states where they, well, Georgia in particular, where they were making it harder to vote. This year, we're going to try to do some stuff in um, uh, at UNLV in Las Vegas and hopefully with Arizona State, um, you know, because those are the um, nearby battleground states where we could drive to and try to have an impact on on voter turnout. And um, so, um, yeah, you know, so. I would I just kind of wanted um, a minimal amount of money so that I could take on less work. But um, at, yeah. at this point, it, I don't know. I probably couldn't. I uh, maybe maybe right. the second half of this year. But yeah, yeah. But it's interesting to see how hear how you kind of make your decisions and have to juggle things because you you do have this knowledge now that is in demand during these times. So I mean, my fantasy. I don't think this is going to come true. But my fantasy is like person I want to get elected gets elected in November and the person that I'm terrified of goes away and yeah. I can consider some other stuff you know but yeah. I don't see that right now no yeah well Deborah, we're at our time I want to thank you for all the work that you do and it's always I learn so much every time we talk and um, I just really appreciate you being here and being part of the BAC's program
thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, thank you for your interest in, um, in all this stuff. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Take care.